All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to the April 2023 uh, DAS meeting. Uh, we got a very special guest this evening, uh, Michelle Edwards, who is a friend of mine from Dickinson College back in the day. Uh, back, We uh, actually did research at the Lowell Observatory uh, and at Dickinson College using various telescopes over the years. And uh, she was in the astronomy club with me uh, for three years of my college education. I knew her very well. And then after she graduated, she went on to many greater and bigger things. She went to the- Greater than you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've done some interesting things, but she's done very interesting things. I mean, she's been to Florida where she went to the University of Florida and got a PhD in astrophysics. And then she went to the Southern Hemisphere where she was at the Gemini Telescope and the Large Binocular Telescope. And she's done all kinds of research at these places and all kinds of very exciting work. And now she's advanced to the point where she is the associate director of the Kitt Peak National Observatory. And she's currently in that observatory right now. So as a part of her talk, she's gonna introduce us to this wonderful facility. So thank you very much, Michelle. I'm gonna give you a quick view of the audience. And you can see- oh, Thanks, Rob. Talking. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me well and see my slides? We hear yeah. you great. Oh, excellent. Okay. Oh, what a great audience. Rob, thanks so much for the really kind introduction. I'm so pleased to join you today to talk about my experiences working for some of the world's largest observatories. So before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that Kitt Peak National Observatory and the Large Binocular Telescope Observatory sit on the original homelands of the Tonawatam Nation and the San Carlos Apache tribe, respectively. Both people have stewarded their lands since time immemorial. If you are joining from another observatory, I welcome you to privately acknowledge the people upon whose lands your telescope reside. Astronomy is a very visually beautiful science, and it's natural when the field is mentioned to think about the most extreme and exciting results in images, things like black holes, exosolar planets, which are planets found around stars other than our sun, planetary nebulae, which are the evolutionary endpoints of stars about the same mass of our sun, or distant galaxies, gigantic structures containing dust, gas and billions of stars. Some of these are colliding with each other, forming elaborate and spectacular objects like the antennae galaxies pictured here, um, which are colliding in acts that astronomers call galactic cannibalism. Yeah. However, what is really rarely considered and discussed are the technologies that we use to create these images and make these amazing discoveries. And since I have worked for two of the world's largest observatories, Gemini South Observatory in La Serena, Chile, and the Large Binocular Telescope Observatory in Arizona. I've built an instrument for a third, and I'm now the Associate Director for Kitt Peak National Observatory, a mountaintop with almost 20 telescopes and groundbreaking instruments. I, I thought it would be interesting to focus on the techno technological advances that make this science possible. But before I start to talk about those telescopes, I want to talk about the field of astronomy and the scale of the research so that we can better inform our discussion about why we build large ground based telescopes and the other kinds of tools that we use to do our research. Then I want to talk a little bit about the challenges that we encounter both with the science and with those tools and the technologies that we have developed to be able to address these issues and challenges. So the image that I'm showing here is really part of a thrilling story. On first blush, it, it looks fairly boring. There's no dramatic colliding galaxies. There's no exploding stars. However, it's one of the most important images ever taken by astronomers, and it shows the scale of the challenges that we face in the field. So the image is known as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And basically, astronomers pointed the Hubble Space Telescope to a fairly nondescript area of the sky that they had characterized as fairly empty, and then they just took a one million second exposure to see what they would find. And the image that resulted from that exposure that you see here is about one thirteenth millionth of the total area of the sky. To put that in perspective, if you were to extend your arm out um, into the night sky, um, it would subtend about one fiftieth of your thumb. So it's a very small area of the sky that we're looking at here. 
But in this one image, astronomers identified nearly 10,000 galaxies, each with billions of stars. To give you context, our Milky Way galaxy has about 400 billion stars. But what's even more compelling about this image is that it's not just a two-dimensional or even a three-dimensional image, it's really a four-dimensional image. Many of the galaxies that are pictured here are millions or even billions of light years away. And remember that a light year is the distance that light travels in just one year. So when we talk about objects that are millions or billions of light years away, it means that the light that they emitted was emitted millions or billions of light years ago. And it took that long to reach us. And what that means is that this image is actually a historical image of these galaxies. So to give you some context, one of these tiny little specks right here is 13 billion light years away, one of the farthest galaxies we've ever seen. And what it means is that we are seeing that light as it was 13 billion years ago when the universe was only about 300 million years old. And so what we see from this image is that we have an incredible amount of volume of space to discover. We have literally billions of objects to research. And we're also looking back in an incredible range of times. And so really astronomy is the study of all matter and all energy in existence and its evolution over 14 billion years. It, in essence, is an immense four-dimensional laboratory. Now, unlike many of its sister sciences like biology, chemistry, geology, and even physics, we can't directly interact with what we want to study. Um, we can't change the physical conditions. We can't take samples. We can't manipulate the objects easily. Frankly, the stars are just too far away. So um, this really makes us wonder, how do we manage to study these objects? Um, and we are really lucky and, and thankful that we're able to observe astronomical objects thanks to the laws of physics. Um, we find that astronomical objects emit many types of radiation or light. And in fact, they emit across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, all the way from the radio to the microwave to the gamma ray. So really, we look at the electromagnetic spectrum as the astronomer's toolbox. Now, very unlucky for astronomers, but lucky for pretty much all life on Earth, um, some wavelengths of radiation do not penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. And these include the ultraviolet, the X-ray, the gamma ray, and portions of the microwave and infrared spectrum. So as I mentioned, this is good for life on Earth because the absence of this type of radiation has allowed life as we know it to develop on this planet. Um, however, astronomers are not daunted. And so what they've done is uh, to get outside of the Earth's atmosphere, they have built space-based observatories. Here are pictured some of the great observatories um, that we have built in collaboration with NASA. And the idea here is that we want to get all the pieces of the puzzle, all the light that these objects emit, so that we can understand as much as possible about the physical properties and the phenomena that cause the radiation in these wavelengths. However, fortunately for us, some light does penetrate the Earth's atmosphere, the visible and the infrared. So visible light is the light that we see with our own eyes, and the infrared is something like uh, the body heat that our bodies give off. Um, we do obviously also build space observatories to observe these wavelengths of light. So for instance, the Hubble Space Telescope and the new JWST observe in these wavelengths. But we also are able to observe this light from the ground. And so ground-based telescopes are really what I'm gonna be focusing on today. So before we talk more about uh, the telescopes themselves, I wanted to backtrack and talk about some light collection basics. So really what we need to understand is that since light is one of our only tools, we wanna to collect as much of it as possible. We don't wanna waste any of it. Um, and what we find is that our ability to gather light, our light gathering power is proportional to the area of the aperture that we're using to gather the light. That sounds a little complex on first blush, but when you think about it, it's kind of like going out in a rainstorm with a bucket. And if you have a bucket that is very narrow, you're not gonna collect very much light in a short amount of time. If you go with a bucket that has a much larger aperture, a much larger opening, in the same amount of time, you'd collect more light. And it turns out there's a very simple equation that would tell you um, what your, you know, if we consider that the, the, the starlight coming from the, uh, you know, basically coming from space um, is similar to like rain coming from the clouds. The bucket that you'd use to collect the rain is similar to the telescopes, the aperture of the telescopes and the light buckets that we use to collect that light. 
And so what we find actually is that a very simple equation can tell us how much better we do with larger apertures. And that's this light gathering power equation, which is related to the area of one aperture over the area of the other. I remind everyone that area is basically defined as pi r squared. And so the light gathering power um, is a function of the radius of the object that you're doing to collect the light. Our most powerful and our primary light gathering collection optic is our eye. And it currently has, it has a radius of about four millimeters when it's dark adapted. Now, if you take a modest telescope that you're all probably used to seeing, which is the 24 inch herd telescope that's there at Mount Cuba Observatory, it's a 24 inch telescope, which means it has a radius of 12 inches or 305 millimeters. If you were to make a comparison of the light gathering power between your eye and your telescope, you would find that the herd telescope gives you 5,800, more than 5,800 times the light gathering power of your eye. So you can see right away how much more powerful we allow ourselves to be by building telescopes. So why is this good? Well, the light, more light that you collect, um, the fainter objects that you're able to see. Some objects are faint because they're intrinsically faint. It's the physics of how they are emitting their light. Some objects are faint or appear faint because they are distant. So by allowing ourselves uh, to collect more light, by building telescopes and using more than just our eye, we are able to see both fainter and farther. So I wanted to just kind of put here, uh, so you have some points of comparison, what different sized large telescopes, the light gathering power that they offer in comparison to our eye. So if you were to look at the four meter Mayal telescope, which is actually here, if you're looking at my video, that's the four meter Mayal at Kipik National Observatory. Um, that is about 250,000 times the light gathering power of your eye. Gemini telescope in La Serena, Chile is about a million times. And the largest single aperture telescope in the world for the optical telescopes, the 10.4 meter Gran Telescopio Canarias in the Canary Islands is about 1.69 million times the light gathering power of your eye. Okay, so now we've sort of talked about why we need to build these bigger telescopes. We also need to think about how we're gonna capture the light from those telescopes and record it. So early astronomers really did sit behind their telescopes and use an eyepiece to observe the, the light that their telescopes collected. However, this led to um, some pretty catastrophic scientific errors. One of my most favorite was made by Percival Lowell's. Percival Lowell was an incredibly famous astronomer who built Lowell Observatory, which Rob mentioned, in Flagstaff, Arizona. And in 1895, using his refracting telescope, he discovered canals on Mars. He spent so many nights actually cataloging bright and dark areas on Mars that he believed were agriculturally driven. He had an entire vision that there was a canal system built by Martians, and it actually actually um, helped to inspire H.G. Wells' story, War of the Worlds. So we can see that, you know, given the objective, uh, you know, if we're looking at our subjective views of something with our eyes um, and simply recording images down, we can make some, some fairly catastrophic scientific mistakes. And so modern astronomers have moved far away from this. We don't look through eyepieces and record anything anymore um, just with our papers and pens. We are using, aided by rapid advances in solid state physics, we use state-of-the-art detectors inside specially cooled cryogenic large format instruments to record digital Im images. Now, this isn't like the phone that you have in your pocket. Um, these cameras are gigantic. So I have two here, for example, this is Circe that's on the Grand Telescope of Canarias and GMOS that's at Gemini South. And you can see for scale, there are people next to these instruments. They are gigantic. They are the size of small closets and the next generation of instruments will be the size of rooms. So these instruments can cost between 10 and $40 million or more, and they may take between five to 20 years from design to installation on the telescope, and none of them are off the shelf. They're designed, built, and tested at major research institutions, usually by multi-person teams, and they are generally very one of a kind. I thought I'd show an, in, uh, an image of an instrument that's near and dear to my heart. Um, these are the optics. This is the optical bench of Circe, which was the instrument that I helped to design and build as part of my dissertation at the University of Florida. And so one of the things I want you to notice here um, is this optic here. So this optic is actually just a simple fold mirror, um, but it kind of, it is the first optic that the beam of the telescope will encounter. And you can see that this is easily the size of a person's head. Um, and so the beam of the telescope is literally the size of your head. Pretty hard to put an eyepiece there. I, I wouldn't want to use my eyes to observe that kind of light. 
Um, and so this just gives you a sense of scale of just how large these, these optics are. And these are all custom designed, all reflective optics um, that are actually aspheric in design. So, so highly, highly specialized. Now, because these cameras are so expensive and because they take so long to build, you really want them to be able to do more than just basic imaging. So most of these instruments are what we call multimoded, and they generally do imaging, which is taking those beautiful pictures and spectroscopy. I want to remind everyone about spectroscopy because it is such a powerful tool in astronomy. So when we talk about spectroscopy, generally we have the light from an astronomical image and it's passing through an optic. In this case, that optic is shown as a prism and that prism is dispersing the light into its spectrum. Now, most of us think about a spectrum. We think about optical spectrum, Roy G. Biv. And so that's kind of pictured here. But astronomers actually see two different types of spectra, emission spectra and absorption spectra. In emission spectra, you have a very hot gas that is emitting when the light goes through the prism, it separates out into what's called a line spectrum, and that's shown here. The important thing about the line spectrum is that those lines are very specialized footprints. Each element has their own footprint. So by noting the lines that we see in a spectrum, we can actually tell what the composition of the gas that is emitting would be. And so obviously hydrogen, helium, say neon, all of these gases would have a different footprint. And by identifying the lines in the line spectrum, we can identify the gas. Absorption spectrum works somewhat the same way, except in this case, you have one bright light source and a cooler gas in front of that light source. When the light hits the prism and it's dispersed, you see a continuous spectrum, which you see here. However, you can also see these black lines, which we call absorption lines in the spectrum. These black lines, again, have very specific footprints that correspond to the element of the gas. So if the gas in front of the bright source is helium, you would see the spectrum for helium. You'd see particular wavelength lines in the continuous spectrum absorption lines. So one can see how understanding with a composition of an object could be a very important tool to the modern astronomer. And I have here just a picture of what an astronomical spectrum might look like at the telescope. This is the spectra of a star. So one of the things you'll notice is that right away, it's not nearly as thrilling as some of those very flashy uh, images that you've seen, say, from the Hubble um, Treasury program. However, this image is very exciting to astronomers, and that is because um, what you're seeing here in these absorption lines tells us so much about the chemistry and the input, the makeup of the star. It'll tell us what elements are in the star, which might help us know the age of the star, the mass of the star, might tell us something about how the star was born, how it might even die. And so really through spectroscopy, we get to physics. And physics is really the benchmark of astronomy at this point. We're also able at times to see emission spectra. So this is the spectrum of a quasar. A quasar, of course, is a very active galaxy with a black hole in its center. And here we're actually seeing um, different types of gas in emission. And that can tell us something about the magnetic fields that are present in that quasar. It can tell us something about how the gas is moving, the, the magnetohydrodynamics. So again, we're like we're able to drill down into the physics by using spectra. Okay, so obviously um, having a multi-moded instrument is really important and special, but what would be even more special is if we could take spectroscopy of more than one object at a time, maybe even taking spectroscopy of thousands of an objects simultaneously. And this brings me to share with you DESI. So DESI is an instrument that's installed on the Kitt Peak 4 meter at the Mayall Telescope. And here I have pictured um, in this image here, these are 5,000 robotic positioners that live at the prime focus of the telescope. It's actually one section of the petals where 5,000 robotic positioners live. Each of them holds on to a fiber optic cable. They can be configured to any orientation on the night sky in three minutes. And when that is done, the light from the galaxies or stars that want to be observed will go down the fiber optic cable and feed 10 three armed spectrographs, which are shown here, there is an entire room of spectrographs in the four meter telescope at Kitt Peak Observatory. And this allows us to take the entire optical spectra of 5,000 objects at the same time. 
This project is paid for by the Department of Energy. It's a multi-million dollar project, around $150 million. And they have basically started a five-year dedicated survey to map all the dark energy in our universe and to come up with the best three-dimensional map that we can make of the universe. So this is the kind of instrument and the kind of uh, problem solving that we have um, for some of the challenges that we face of all of those tens of thousands of galaxies and billions and billions of stars. So now that we've uh, kind of powered our discussion about why we build large telescopes, why we build these instruments that go on the back of these large telescopes, I thought I'd give you some insight into what it's like to work for world class astronomical observatories. As I've mentioned, I've had the pleasure of working at Gemini South Telescope, the Large Binocular Telescope Observatory, and now I'm the Associate Director here at Peak National Observatory. And the one thing that I have found in common at all observatories is that we are always striving to solve challenges to produce the best science. So I thought I'd kind of walk us through like one very interesting and exciting challenge that we I've encountered at some of the larger telescopes that I've worked at um, and kind of give you some idea of um, some of the real real problems that we face. Before I talk about that, though, I want to take a step back a little bit and just review uh, something called resolving power and resolution. This is really important moving forward. So if you were to start in, in the right hand side at the bottom image, um, you can see that this is an object that basically looks like it is one object and it's extended. It looks very blobby and you really can't identify much about this object. Um, but as you can see, as you move upwards in this diagram, you can see that those objects start to uh, separate out and actually, we say, resolve uh, so that you can identify that it's not one blobby object, but actually two objects close together. Our ability to do this or our resolving power is the ability of an optical instrument to separate faraway objects that are close together into individual images or to separate out objects that are physically close together into individual images. And one of the most important equations in all of astronomy um, is this equation that I have here. I don't have too many equations in this talk, but this is an important one. The thing to take away about this is that you'll notice um, that this equation on the bottom of the equation, it says 1.22d, where d is the diameter of the aperture. What this tells us is that as we increase the diameter of our aperture, in this case, the diameter of our telescopes, our angular resolution, which is our ability to separate out these objects, actually increases. So we want to basically have larger diameter telescopes so that we have more ability to separate out these close together objects. This allows us to study individual objects, otherwise we're just studying what appears to be groups. So in general, we want to minimize the resolvable distance, which means we need a smaller angular resolution, which means a larger diameter. So reminding you that we already build large telescopes that we have better light collecting power, but we also want to build larger telescopes that we can resolve images better. Okay, so we build our larger telescopes, we have our larger D and our problem is solved. Not so quick. Um, there's turbulence in our Earth's atmosphere. Many of us encounter this when we're on an airplane. Um, and believe it or not, the star light that comes from space actually encounters turbulence in the same way. A lot of times when we talk about the twinkling of stars, we're actually talking about the effects of turbulence. Turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere redirects the light of the stars so that sometimes it hits our eyes and sometimes it doesn't, which makes it appear that stars are twinkling. The effect that astronomers see, if you were to take this back and step back and talk about it in a physics way, you can look at this graphic here. The light from the stars appears as a plane wavefront. It hits an inhomogeneous medium, in this case, the Earth's atmosphere. And basically, that perturbs the wavefront. Um, and what that results in on our astronomical images is that instead of seeing simple point sources from astronomical objects, we're actually viewing them as disks. And those disks can have a variety of sizes. We talk about them in terms of an angular size since they are projected onto a three-dimensional sky. Um, and basically the angular size that's really common at the best sites in the world is about 0.4 to one arc seconds. Elsewhere in the world, it can be over one second arc second. I've seen it as big as five arc seconds. I'm sure many of you have as well. When you actually go back to that equation, um, the really important one, um, theta equals 1.22 over lambda d, sorry, lambda over 1.22d. Um, when you go back to that equ equation and you plug it in, what you find is that um, small apertures, apertures of 10 to 20 centimeters, actually see about the same resolution as these giant telescopes. 
In other words, you've lost all of your benefit from your giant telescope because the atmosphere has basically messed everything up for you. And so astronomers were like, how can we possibly fix the effects of the atmosphere? And they came up with this amazing solution called adaptive optics. So what happens in adaptive optics is that we are able to measure the aberrations in that wavefront. So we are able to measure the effects of the atmosphere on the light using something called a wavefront sensor. And then we are able to take the input from that sensor and we are able to basically use a deformable mirror to correct the wavefront, to correct the starlight. So this ends up, of course, the atmosphere is constantly changing and turbulence is constantly changing. So you don't just do this once. You actually do this many, many times. You do it iteratively. So you measure the aberrations or the mistakes in your wavefront. You correct them with your deformable mirror. And then the turbulence changes and you correct and you measure and you correct and you measure. And that process is called closing the adaptive optics loop. And we do this at upwards of a thousand hertz. So this happens very quickly with state of the art computational you know, um, analysis. So I have a movie here and I love this movie because it actually is a real movie of what it is like when you are at a telescope and you close the adaptive optics loop. So this is going to be an image of our galactic center. So the very center of our galaxy where we know there's a supermassive black hole and astronomers were trying to visualize the individual stars around that black hole and understand how they were moving, because that would tell us something about the mass of that black hole. Prior to adaptive optics, all of those stars were smushed together, could not identify individual stars. Then the advent of adaptive optics, you went from this to this. I'll show that movie again. It's really pretty stunning. That's what the Galactic Center looked like before adaptive optics. And this is what it looked like after. And you can start to see that individual stars in the Galactic Center really just pop right out. And we were able to track the motion of these stars um, and basically to, to prove not only that the massive black hole was there in the center of the galaxy, but to determine a mass. So this is the kind of research that adaptive optics has, has basically um, pushed to the forefront. Okay, so now we have our adaptive optics, we have our large telescope, we think that our problems are solved. But of course, like with anything, we face challenges. And one of the challenges is the technology. So the wavefront sensors themselves are, are very um, developed technologies, but it turns out that uh, you need a really bright star to be able to do this kind of analysis to make the corrections. And only about one to 5% of the entire sky even has a star bright enough to do this with the current generation of wavefront sensors. And so, okay, if I don't have a real star that's bright enough to do the correction, what could I do? Well, I could make my own star. And I do that with lasers. So many large uh, astronomical observatories have laser guide stars. They literally have lasers uh, built at the tops of the telescopes. Those lasers launch into the sodium layer of the atmosphere. They excite the sodium laser and they create what's called a laser guide star or a laser beacon. And so by producing this very bright star, pretty high in the atmosphere, they're able to basically uh, analyze that star and fix the turbulence from there downward. And that corrects for most of the turbulence that the starlight is seeing. And so this was really an amazing technology that opened up adaptive optics to huge areas of the sky. Okay, so now we have lasers, we have special adaptive optics, we have cameras that will record the image, we have giant telescopes, we must be done. Well, it turns out that we're not, because um, what we found is that the atmosphere is very complex. And really lasers and one wavefront sensor and one deformable mirror is only able to correct for like one layer of that atmosphere, one layer of that turbulence. And so what we found was that as we moved further away from the laser on the image, uh, from where the laser was physically located, where that guide star was located, that the star started to look extended and elongated again and blobby. And so we lost a lot of the benefit of our correction. And this was actually called the cone effect. And so we had to think, okay, well, how could we fix this? How can we basically model many layers of the atmosphere? How can we build a complex model of turbulence? And the answer to that question was more lasers. <laughs> and so that's exactly what we have done. Um, I was very honored to be part of the end of a 10 year project to outfit the Gemini South Observatory with the world's first multi-laser guide star system. 
This system actually had five lasers. Each were very powerful, about 10 watts. And this beacon produced five laser guide stars. And there's actually an image. This is a real image that someone took with a little tiny telescope and a camera to actually showcase um, what that five-star beacon looked like on the sky. And the goal of this entire thing is to gain back the true resolving power of our eight meter telescope to turn our telescope from not just a light gathering agent, but also a resolution agent. And so that's what this whole project is about. And again, I was very honored to participate in over 50 nights. Um, that we spent on sky at the very end of the project readying the system for science operations worked with a team of over 20 people there were so many subsystems the laser the instrument that received the light the the telescope itself um the late we actually had people out um watching the laser to make sure that planes didn't didn't actually go within the lasers uh, area right because that would be really bad for the planes so it was a whole team of people that worked on this and the results were really stunning so these were actually the first light images and this science in this field has just gotten better and better since then. If you look over to your right and you look at the bottom you'll see a seeing limited image seeing limited is what we call images that are impacted by turbulence so that's what you would see without any adaptive optics. The next image up, the image above it is a classical AO so that would be with like one laser or maybe just a natural guide star and then you have the gem system, which was this multi laser system. And what you can easily see is that in the classical AO system, you, you definitely see that stars are elongated, they start to be aligning together. Here in the GEMS corrected image, you can see it's extremely crisp, the, the stars are all round, which makes them easier to measure, um, and you can see real separation. And so again, the goal of this was to recapture um, the power of that eight meter telescope. And other telescopes around the world are now starting to use this technology. Um, many telescopes have lasers, telescopes like Keck and Subaru. Um, this multi-laser uh, system is actually um, being uh, built and installed at Gemini North Observatory now. Okay, so up to this point, we've talked a lot about larger telescopes and larger instruments. Um, but one of the things I love about working at observatories is that some of the fundamental questions in astronomy that really push the frontiers of the technology do not always have their answers in the largest telescopes. So one of humanity's fundamental questions is, are we alone? And the discovery of the first extrasolar planets, these are planets that go around a star that's not the sun. They were discovered in the 1990s and they started to provide us a tantalizing taste of the future. In the 30 years since then, we have identified over 5,000 extrasolar planets. And we've done this with a variety of methods and telescopes, both ground-based and space-based. Today, I am going to talk and focus on the radial velocity method of extrasolar planet detection. So I have this graphic here, it's really important um, to understand that the radial velocity method is a spectroscopic method. So one of the many reasons I reminded you about what spectroscopy means for astronomers. When you have a star that is solitary, that is that it has no planet or planetary systems, the center of mass of that star is, the, the center of mass of the system is the center of mass of the star. In other words, the star rotates and robs around its own center of mass. When you have a star that has planets or a solar system, there's other mass other than the star in that system, which means that the center of the mass of the system is no longer the center of the star. We often call this common center of mass a Berry center. In this image, you can see what happens when the Berry center of the system is not the center of the star. Normally, if you were to look at a stellar spectrum, what you would note, you would note the absorption lines, remember these are the special lines that we see given by the composition of the star. Now when this star is orbiting this Berry center or this common center of mass, which you can see in this image here, what we notice is that when the star is moving away from us in this orbit, all of the lines, the absorption lines are shifted into the red portion of the spectrum. And what we notice is that when the star begins to move towards us around that common center of mass, all of those absorption lines are shifted to the blue. This is a really common effect known as the Doppler effect. We most often recognize this when we think about an ambulance speeding toward us. And we notice that as it speeds towards us, the pitch is higher and as it moves away from us, it's lower. 
And so this same effect that we see with sound or we hear with sound, we also see with light. Now, what this means is that if we are able to detect the shift of these lines in a star spectrum, we're able to infer the, the, uh, the existence of a planet or a planetary system around a star. One of the things that falls out from this is an obvious fact, which is that if you have a very massive planet, you're going to see a much larger effect than if you have a smaller planet. That's because a heavier planet, a more massive planet will pull the common center of mass or the Berry center further outside, further away from the star center of mass, which will enhance this effect. So as we search for Earth 2.0, um, this is really a process. The very first planets that were detected using this radial velocity method were called hot Jupiters. Again, I remind you that very large planets will, you will see this effect much more easily. And so the first planets that we identified were Jupiter like planets that were very close to their host stars. In fact, they had about less than a 10 day orbital period. And detecting these Jupiter like objects close to their host stars required instruments that were capable of a certain precision, we say 90 meters per second radial velocity precision, that is how much those lines were physically moving in the spectrum. Okay, and at the time in the 1990s we actually had instruments that were capable of doing this, which is why these were the objects we found first. However, finding and characterizing Earth like planets is much harder. Earth is a lot less massive than Jupiter, which means the effects on the radial velocity are far smart, smaller. Of course, why are we looking for planets in the habitable zone? And what is the habitable zone? The habitable zone is the area around each star where we believe liquid water can occur. The temperatures and conditions are just correct. And if you're looking for an Earth-like planet, you definitely wanna find one that likely has liquid water. So just to give you some idea of what we are facing here, this is just a little table that shows um, how much of so this K here is actually a radial velocity measurement. And you can just think of it, the numbers aren't so important as noticing the scale of the numbers. So for a Jupiter-like planet, very close, like the orbit of Mercury within that, you're looking for something that's at a radial velocity of 90. But look at Earth at its distance from the sun, which we call 1 AU. And you can see it's much smaller. In fact, it's very tiny. It's so tiny that small temperature and pressure deviations within an instrument measuring this effect actually are much larger than the effect. A person walking by this spectrograph would swamp the signal. That is how small the signal is. And so what this means is that we require very special instruments with extreme precision that are in tightly controlled environments where the pressure and temperature are constantly monitored and left alone. And it also requires what we call an excellent cadence. You don't observe these objects just once. You observe them many, many, many times. And to do that on a larger telescope is very, very difficult. Larger telescopes all the time um, is competitively used and it's very strictly doled out, and it's very difficult to get a lot of time on the world's largest telescopes. So by going to smaller telescopes, and by smaller, I still mean fairly large, and we'll get to that in a minute, you're able to have a cadence, you're able to observe the same object many, many times. And that brings us to NUID and the Annan Explore program. So I'm very pleased to say that we are here at uh, Peak National Observatory, discovering new worlds with precision at the WIN 3.5 meter telescope. So NUID is a special instrument. Again, a very specialized instrument. It's pictured here. You can see this is the instrument when it's opened and this is extremely rare. This instrument may be open like this one or two or possibly three times in its entire decadal lifetime. The idea is never to open this instrument. So it's a rare glimpse inside this instrument, which is highly temperature and pressure controlled. So this instrument is actually a partnership between NSF and NASA uh, and a program called NET Explore. It allows NUID to be built and offered to the entire US astronomical community. So NUID is an extreme precision radial velocity spectrograph and it was designed to have about a 30 centimeter per second precision. Now you'll remember that to find an Earth-like planet, we need nine centimeters per second. So we're not even to the technological point being able to detect an Earth-like planet yet, but we are looking for super Earths and we are able to actually 
um, reduce this amount of, of precision, so actually improve the precision over time. So this instrument actually, it's like a good wine, it'll get better with age. Um, Kit Peak, I wanna remind everyone, is actually located on the Tona Atom Nation. And so in order to honor our partnership with the Tona Atom people, the instrument was named Nuid, which is the Tona Atom word that means to see. Okay, so now we come to the slightly more interesting part of this talk, and I'm really hoping that this will work. So I am actually sitting in the wind control room, and I wanted to just briefly show you what the wind control room looks like. So what you see behind me, you'll notice that there one are- second. Oh. Yep. We're just getting reset. There you go. Great. Oh, yeah. So I am sitting in the control room of the 3.5 meter wind telescope. Um, this is the second largest telescope that's here on Kitt Peak. Although the four meter telescope, the actual um, open aperture of that telescope is very, very similar. Um, this telescope was built in the 1990s. It was actually a, a test bed for many new technologies that went on uh, to influence telescopes like Gemini Observatory, the Subaru Telescope, and Keck. Um, and so it is, it is what is considered to be one of the first of the modern observatories. Um, and so I'm not sure if you can see, I'm um, out the window. <laughs> that is the four meter Mayall telescope. Okay, and then I will just, hope this works. I'll take you over here. What else so this you is, Can you see? Okay. Yeah. So this is actually where the instrument scientist or the astronomer would sit. So every night at the telescope, because it is such a large telescope, and there are so many subsystems for this telescope and the instrument, there are generally two people here per night. You have a telescope operator whose main job it is to make sure the telescope is operating correctly. He is also, or she is also, the safety officer officer at the telescope. So this is where the telescope operator would sit, and you see this giant bank of monitors here. You can imagine how many subsystems um, on any given night that they have to watch. And then this is actually where the astronomer sits. So because the telescope is so complex and because the instruments are so complex, um, you can't have one person doing both. The person who is taking the data really needs to be monitoring the instrument at all times um, and monitoring the quality of the data. So it's really a, a two person job. OK, so um, I want to we are actually going to take a brief pause. So one of the things about working at a major observatory, especially one that has radio telescopes, is that the Wi-Fi signals here are not good. There's actually no Wi-Fi connection in the dome itself. So I'm going to take a brief pause. I have another teles another computer that's actually connected up in the dome. So I'm going to take a brief pause here. I'm going to go up in the dome and turn on that camera, and we're going to just do a brief tour of the wind telescope inside the dome. Awesome. Catch it in a few seconds, Michelle. <laughs> I would say that it doesn't affect it all that much because it's just moving the right bound. It's not changing the frequency. But it can, it can adjust it a little bit because it's going to be or something. So maybe so. It might spear it out. It depends. Normally, you want the slope to be very large, as large as the object so that you gather as much light as possible. Okay. And if you, if you make the slit anywhere near the cool. resolution on the telescope, you're not going to get out as much light. So, so what is this really, you're not, uh, you're not hurt that much by the same way. Okay. It's the most common problem. Your telescope's not going to be able to do it. Yeah, I do. We can hear you. Hi, everyone. Hey. It worked. It did. So I am now standing here inside of the dome of the 3.5 meter wind telescope. And I've asked the telescope operator to open our mirror cover. So I'm gonna try and walk you around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Oh, hey, Michelle, hang on once. Yeah. 
I'm going to just maybe need to re mute. I need to tend to mute everybody. Just give us 10 seconds and we'll be. I don't know if I can. I think it's just because maybe Glenn is unmuted. Uh, Do you want to mute everyone again, Rob? I just. Hold on. Hello, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me? One second. Now make sure she's not muted. Well, now she's so right. can you unmute yourself real quick, Michelle? It is quite noisy up here. You may be hearing the noise from the telescope. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Now. Sounds good. Okay. A very uh, real world experience. <laughs> oh. Oh. So I'm just going to kind of aim. So what you're seeing here is the secondary mirror of the telescope that's contained inside of this black cylinder. You'll notice that this telescope is very open to the air, and that's done very purposefully. Early telescopes that were giant tubes, we realized very early on that large domes and these large telescopes with these cylinders were creating their own atmosphere, their own environment. And we talked about how difficult it is to fight the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. We are actually creating turbulence inside our own domes and telescopes. And so we learned this lesson early on and telescopes have now completely changed their structure. Most of the telescopes will open vents around the entire dome. The telescopes themselves are very open air. And this actually helps astronomers to correct those atmospheric effects. Um, we call the turbulence in the atmosphere, we call that astronomical seeing. We call the turbulence inside of our domes, dome seeing. And you want your dome seeing to be as small as possible. So I'm just gonna walk around a little bit. What you'll notice, the wind telescope actually has uh, many astronomical instruments that are mounted directly to this telescope off on ports. This gold thing that is behind me is part of the camera called ODI, which is the one degree imager. So it is what the name says, an imager that is one degree. I am gonna actually walk us to the back of the telescope so that you can see what Active optics, these are systems that are actively controlling the primary mirror of the telescope. This is what it looks like. Oh, wow. <laughs> Very cool. So each of these is basically a little motor that helps to shape the primary mirror. This is not adaptive optics. Um, because it's happening very slowly. These corrections happen on the time scale of 30 seconds. And what this is actually doing is because these mirrors are so big, the force of gravity actually changes the figure of the optic. And so in order to fix that and basically recover the optical figure, as the telescope moves around, these actuators do that work of shaping the primary mirror. So they fix things like astigmatism. Oh, so Michelle, this is not the system you were talking about earlier with the laser. No. no, this is actually a predecessor to that system called active optics. So a little bit different and it functions much more slowly. But the idea is, again, this was a, a telescope that in many ways was a test bed for the types of technologies that we used on the larger eight and 10 meter class telescopes. The active, you said the laser one was adaptive. Optics. Adaptive optics. Okay, yeah. thank you for clarifying. And even still, adaptive optics can be done with natural stars. That's called natural guide star adaptive optics. The ones that use lasers are called laser guide star adaptive optic systems, and both exist. Cool. cool. This is another instrument called Hydra. Hydra, in some ways, is like a predecessor to DESI. It is a multi-object spectrograph. It also has robots that have fibers that are positioned over a large field of view. So not nearly as large as DESI, but again, an important step in getting us to there. So I don't know, um, while I'm here, it's probably easier to answer questions about the talk down in the control room. But while I'm here, does anyone have any questions about the telescope itself? What altitude are you at? Uh, not very high. I think it's about 6,900 feet, something like that, about 7,000 feet. Okay. So we're, we're not a very high observatory, but, um, but very high for, for the Tucson area. Gotcha. Could you just maybe just do one more little pan around the room? Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
I don't think there's a primary F and D for the actuators we're working. We're not seeing that. Oh, we just lost. Yeah. As soon as she talks, so. it'll. Yeah, whoever. Do you see it? I, oh, because I'm, yeah. A quick note, I think for people on Zoom, they might get a different view. I think you can individually pin um, the yes. view. So everyone on Zoom, I think you should individually pin Michelle's video feed. That way it'll stay yeah. present. Yeah, right. Right. I can also talk a little bit too, because I think that will make the video stay, yeah. stay yes. in place. And so as long as I'm, I'm talking, um, and so, yeah, I'm just panning across. That's the primary mirror. You can see that there is a hole in the primary mirror. Um, that's extremely common for these large telescopes. Um, that is often, sometimes there are instruments that sit below. Um, and you can see again, you know, that the mirror covers are open. We're actually trying to replace these mirror cover covers because um, they're very large and they catch the wind and they act like wind baffles. And so there's actually a project to replace these mirror covers um, I'm pointing up now, so I'm kind of standing underneath, and I'm pointing you towards what is the secondary mirror of the telescope. I think maybe possibly might be able to go. Oh, yeah. There we go. That's great. That's the secondary mirror. I get a little closer to the primary. Is that a flat screen we also caught? Yeah, so this is a flat screen. It's a large, larger flat screen than you're probably used to. <laughs> and then again, this is one of the instruments here, which is an imaging instrument called the one degree imager. Now, NUID, you don't see on this telescope, and that is because it is in its own room. There is a, at the very top and very hard to see, a black box. That blocks, box is how we acquire the star signal or the planet signal. It's then fed into a specially controlled, climate controlled, pressure controlled room down in the basement of the telescope. And that's where the instrument actually lives in its own climate and pressure controlled environment. So you won't see much of NUID other than that small box. And then again, this is Hydra. Is there any way to get a visual of uh, see the thickness of the mirror or can you maybe not? Uh, no, because it's in a cell. Yeah, but how <laughs> thick is it? I'm so, um, so this mirror is one of the thinner classes of mirrors. Um, I think it's probably something like, I would think maybe four or five inches. It's fairly thin. It's not like there are other mirrors that are made, for instance, at the University of Arizona. And those mirrors can be 12 inches thick and they are um, honeycombed mirrors. So there's a few different ways of making large telescope mirrors. And I believe this is one of the thinner optics. Cool. Is this mirror segmented? This is not a segmented mirror. Okay. This is one, one big old mirror. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to sign off on this computer. I'm going to go back down uh, to the control room and then, you know, I will be free to answer any questions that you have about the talk when I return um, or to turn it back over over to Rob. Awesome. Thank you. So did Anthony pop in and say that he's in Arizona? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How about that? Probably not a good peak though. Phoenix, gotcha. Mm -hmm. There it is. <laughs> oh, we should bring up some tedious back on. There are several questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, while we're waiting, the people on Zoom, I guess I think we're entering the question and answer period. Um, I should have said this at the beginning, we're not, because of the way we do this, we're not necessarily in the best position to be monitoring the chat. Um, if anyone on Zoom has questions for Michelle, um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. Because um, again, we might not catch it if you ask it in the chat window. I just switched it over so that it's a gallery view, so we won't have any problem if we did before. Yeah. See, in this view, I can pin people. Yeah. But in the other view, I wasn't able to. Yeah. So, I'm geographic Kip Peak is near what? Tucson. Tucson. Near Tucson? Yeah. Okay. To the southeast. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Tucson's got a nice light station. 
Oh, oh yeah, so we got five chapters too. That mm -hmm. old. Mm -hmm. We got some nice laws there. And Phoenix and Flagstaff are very close, right? Like two, three hours. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And where's Tucson in relation to all those? That's two so, hours to yeah. south. Okay. To the southeast. Like, I I waste. Yeah. This, this here is Phoenix. There's Tucson. There's Flagstaff. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the meeting is down in the Tucson area. Mm. Okay. My sister was halfway to Flagstaff and Phoenix, and she's about an hour and a half, two hours. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I spent mm -hmm. a lot more time in the north around Flagstaff. Mm -hmm. I like that point. Oh, she's hey, hey. There she is. Hi. All right, there were several questions in the chat. Let me just take a look real quick. So I'll start with one. Does the telescope we just looked at? Only has active adaptors or has both? No, the telescope that we just looked at has active optics, which means that we control the primary mirror and we control that slowly, like at a rate of 30 seconds. It's, it's a slow correction. The adaptive optic systems generally tend to be found on some of the larger telescopes, like eight to 10 meter telescopes. Again, part of that is because they see the most benefit from them, because remember that their larger diameter means they have the ability to resolve, you know, even, you know, smaller objects. And closer together objects and so while there would be benefit to putting an, a system like that on a four meter telescope the most benefit is realized from the larger telescopes and so that's where most of that technology has happened and did i read somewhere that active optics actually works on the secondary mirror there are some active optics that do work on the secondary mirror you can do what's called a tip tilt correction um, and so that's actually absolutely correct um, and so what's considered to be active optics is a fa fairly broad but the idea is that anything that's happening, um, you know, again, adaptive optics are happening at 1000 hertz or 1600 hertz. Active optics can happen at the secondary mirror at about 100 to 200 hertz. And that's very common at, say, like a Gemini Observatory will run in an active optics mode all the time, actually. The Gemini mirror is always doing active optics at the secondary. And that tip tilt correction is really something that helps. Again, that is also the type of error that's correcting. So adaptive optics is correcting errors that are due to the atmosphere and turbulence. Active optics are correcting optical errors. So errors either in placement, you know, errors that happen because of temperature changes in the optics of the telescope or gravity vectors. And so that's also like a major difference. Um, what you're correcting and the speed at which you're correcting. And do any mirrors use both? Oh, I'm sorry, it was hard to hear that one. Do any mirrors use both? Is there a telescope system that has both systems? Actually, interestingly, the Large Binocular Telescope Observatory, um, it's a very special uh, telescope. So it is, as it says it is, it, it is basically two 8.4 meter mirrors that are mounted on a single mount. And when it moves, it moves much like a pair of binoculars. So both telescopes move on that mount at the same time. The secondary mirrors that are at the Large Binocular Telescope Observatory, they themselves are one meter wide, big, one meter in diameter. Uh, deformable mirrors. So they themselves are the deformable mirrors of an adaptive optic system. However, they also do do active optics. And so that telescope can be in a passive active optics mode where the deformable mirror is what we call flattened. Um, and so basically it's, it's not, the shape is not changing, um, but then we can apply active optic corrections to correct for uh, things like tip tilt pointing errors and then um, on top of that, an adaptive optics correction can be applied when the mirror is in a deformable mode. Many telescopes actually operate like this, but the large binocular telescope is particularly interesting because it's one of the only ones in the world that has a deformable mirror mounted at its secondary focus um, that's on the telescope all the time. And that was a fairly new technology. On, on these larger telescopes, are, the, are they the ones that are segmented? I had a hard... I always had a hard time differentiating adaptive optics and active optics. And actually today I'm very, very happy uh, that I learned a lot more about it. But I always thought that the actuators uh, only worked on individual segments of a mirror. Now I see that you have a three and a half meter telescope that is one big mirror that the that, that the actuators actually move. Okay. And you're, you're um, making that mirror actually called deformable if the actuators can move. 
it's not called a deformable mirror. Again, it's, it's, it, I can see why you would think it might be because we are slightly deforming the mirror, but deformable mirrors have a much larger, what we call stroke. So that stroke is the ability, how much they can deform um, and how fast they deform. So again, that they're happening at a thousand Hertz. This is just small pressures that we're applying to the primary mirror surface. Um, and it's making a much smaller, um, a much smaller shape over a much larger area. So yes, it, it does seem like it would be called a deformable mirror, but deformable mirrors are the name of a very specific type of technology. So if that if that kind of helps, realizing so then, it might be a bit of a misnomer. That, and then back to my original question, then the larger telescopes you're talking about, are they really segmented mirrors rather than, because I understand you know, you know, the law of diminished returns, you can't build a mirror that this big, you know, without being basically individual segments anymore, you know, without the weight being, you know, unbelievable. So the oh. eight meter mirrors, all of the ones that I have worked on have actually not been segment segmented. No kidding. Wow. Yeah. So I can actually show <laughs> quickly. Let's just see if I, oops, yikes. I just quickly can share my screen again, maybe. I can show you. Um, so this is actually, I don't know if you can see this here, if I maybe just yes. play it. Oops, nope. Sorry, I had a I had some slides at the end here, just in case. There we go. So this is actually the large binocular telescope observatory. Each of these mirrors is 8.4 meters, so very large, and you can see from this image that they are not segmented. So the interesting thing that these mirrors are actually made underneath the University of Arizona football stadium <laughs> um, in a special lab called the Mirror Lab. And that mirror lab was developed by the University of Arizona professor named Roger Angel, and he's quite famous for this. So you're right, absolutely right, that making a mirror of this size, it would be incredibly heavy and difficult to, to maneuver. So what he's actually done is he made these honeycomb. These are incredibly lightweighted mirrors. Um, basically, most of the material of the mirror is not there. They stick in, when they make these, they stick in ceramic forms in the shape of honeycombs. And so actually there's not that much glass. There's a very stiff honeycomb structure underneath the surface and then there's one flat surface that's only about maybe an inch or two thick so there's a solid inch or two thick flat surface and then what amounts to a honeycomb glass structure underneath these mirrors are actually quite thick overall they're like I said they can be a, as large as 12 inches thick um, but there's not a lot of actual material there so they're hyper lightweighted and that's how we make mirrors um, that tend to be all one piece the Gemini mirrors actually are also um, one single mirror that is eight eight meters. Um, but they do that by just having an ultra thin mirror um, it's a very lightweight ultra thin mirror um, that was designed uh, from a different mirror lab. So there are ways to do it now you're absolutely correct that with some of the larger telescopes that we're looking at the the basically horizons of the next 20 to 30 years, most of those telescopes are segmented in some way. So the 30 meter telescope, the TMT as it's called, um, and also the ELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope, are both going to be segmented mirrors, much like the Keck Observatory or the GTC, um, you know, which are like 10 meter, you know, class telescopes. However, there's also going to be a telescope called the GMT. It's segmented, but in a different way. It actually looks like a bunch of petals. There's going to be a bunch of eight meter mirrors that were actually designed in the mirror lab and they are going to surround themselves kind of like a daisy if you think of like how a daisy is set up and so they'll have multiple of those eight meter mirrors to make their overall aperture so segmented mirrors really probably are the future you know if you're talking about a 20 or 30 meter class telescope but for eight to ten meters you still can make a solid mirror Ooh, cool. well, that helps thank you yes that, it very much did help I, mm -hmm. um, thank you for that very good explanation i also want to i'm not showing my video right now but to be, see the big, really big smile on my face for that tour you just gave me, it, yeah. it was absolutely fabulous. I did the walking tour of, of Cape Peak many years ago <laughs> over a two day period and did some observing from, from far south Arizona. Uh, I also, through the NT Telescope Society, got to see the Yerkes Observatory, look at that 40 inch telescope, and also went to Palomar where they gave us a really good guided tour of that telescope. And this is what reminded me of that. So I'm, I'm really having a great time. So thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. I have a question related to um, using the telescope to derive spectra. Um, what kind of exposures can you do? Uh, you know, on I'm assuming that you're you're doing a long exposure in order to get enough light to generate the spectra. What kind of exposure do you do? 
Uh, actually, you can, you, because these telescopes are very large, uh, you can look at objects that are fairly bright and you can take um, pretty short exposures. We actually participated in a project with the wind telescope to look at the moon. <laughs> so, um, and actually we also did that with uh, Gemini Observatory because of the lacrosse project. So I think they were uh, crashing something into the moon and they wanted to observe it from a ground-based observatory. And so Gemini um, did them the honor. I've also personally observed some extremely massive stars um, with Gemini. You just have to wait until the weather's really bad. So um, there are ways to actually take very short exposures with uh, some of these uh, telescopes. In general, you don't necessarily always want to have a very long exposure. Um, you can build up exposure. That's a really common technique. Part of the problem is anytime you're taking a long exposure, you also ended up having a lot of read noise. You have a lot of noise from uh, your detector um, and it starts to swamp your signal. So there's always a balance between taking a long enough exposure that you're being very efficient with your exposure, um, but then you're able to take exposures that, that can stack. So like at Gemini Observatory, it wasn't uncommon to take a 600 second or maybe an 1800 second exposure, um, but it was also not uncommon to take a 30 second exposure. And so really the exposure time has to match the object and what you're trying to accomplish. Right, near right. Infrared, yeah. you definitely want a small, near infrared, you definitely want short exposures all the time and you just stack your frames. Yeah, I would assume you do stacking and yeah. you would an optical uh, uh, AP. And I was just curious knowing what optical uh, exposure times are where you're balancing the exposure time against um, the, the, the um, resolution of your scope. Yeah, I mean, um, basically, uh, again, um, when you, the longer you observe, um, of course, the, the more that you're um, integrating over all the turbulence in your atmosphere, so that can be a problem. Um, but also, you know, frankly, like I said, because um, if you're looking at something very, very, very faint, so faint that if you took a short exposure, you wouldn't have anything to stack, that's generally when we tend to go long. So you're looking at those extremely faint objects, you know, 20th magnitude, 22nd magnitude, and that at an eight meter telescope might be when you're taking an 1800 second exposure, and you need many of them because you won't see anything at all. So of course, for people that aren't aware, stacking images are when you take many exposures, you find say the center of the image and then you add it all up. And because of the way detectors work, they're linear, which means that um, the amount of light scales with the time. So you can do that with uh, CCD technology, with optical CCD technology and with near infrared technology. That was actually one of the most powerful things about the solid state revolution for astronomers. However, if you can't see anything to stack, then you can't stack. So that's when we would take longer exposures, if that makes any sense. Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I have another question, if you don't mind. Um, back in your, one of your first slides, you talked about uh, the spectroscopic actual uh, and actually detectors. And I saw the, the, the if you go back to that slide, it was kind of like a, a, a black um, compartmentalized thing with a bunch of detectors on it. Can you go back to that slide? Not, let me see here. I'm just not sure which slide. It was toward the very beginning where you're talking about spectroscopes, you showed the, the, all the, you know, the 10 spectroscopes on the bottom right of the screen. Oh, here, here, here. I right. Think. Yeah. This one here? Um, I'm not seeing the actual picture right now. I'm seeing you. Oh. Um, That's because I didn't share my screen. Share your screen, okay. Yeah, I got you. Okay, and place some current. So yes, one. that's it. Thank you. Oh. All right. So the the top right picture. Mm -hmm. What actually is that a module? Yeah. So this is called a pedal. Um, okay. There are actually multiple of these pedals that sound exactly like what they are, um, like pedals on a flower. Um, what you're actually seeing here is this actually goes at the focal plane of the telescope. And what you're seeing are the basically where the fiber optic cables connect into the robotic positioners. So you're, you're not seeing this fully mapped out with all of the, you know, as you're only seeing partial part of it. Um, but, you know, this is how basically the idea is that a little robotic positioners would come in and move these little, um, you know, kind of what you're seeing, these tipped objects, which are, are fiber optic objects, move them to where you'd like them in the focal plane. Obviously, let's say that you're looking at, you know, you go to the telescope goes to a field of galaxies, which is mostly what Desi observes. Now, when you get to that field of galaxies, the galaxies are in different positions, depending on where you're pointing in the sky, right? One field will have galaxies in a certain location. 
another field will have galaxies in another location. There's already been pre-imaging surveys that have been done. So we know where all the galaxies are to find positions. And we just command these little robots to move the fiber optics to all the positions where galaxies exist on the sky. And then we start exposing. And so basically this is just one small segment of a petal. And that petal goes in the main focal plane of the telescope. And the robots move, you know, these little fiber optics, which, you know, can take the light in and then deliver them to the spectrographs, which are down in this other picture on the bottom right. So these are actually the instruments that have the detectors that split the light into its component parts. The fiber optics just take the light from the stars as it is. It has to go down to the spectrograph before it's split until its spectrum. Are the spectrographs located in the telescope room itself or down below? The spectrographs are located in a um, room that's kind of off of the main telescope. Okay. So the, the four meter building is extremely large and there's a lot of rooms. You can be down on the ground floor of the telescope and basically the fibers go all the way down the telescope and they go off to the side into the special uh, climate controlled room. Oh, and I can imagine better. how big the room is. When we went to Palomar, we actually drove the bus in underneath the, the telescope into the dome. Yeah. It's exactly. Incredible. Four meter is very large. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, underneath the telescope, one more question, if you don't mind, uh, is there a luminizing chamber down below? Yeah, we actually do have an illuminizing chamber that's off of the uh, ground floor. Um, and we do actually plan to illuminize the um, primary mirror of the four meter this summer. So that will, it will actually be craned down, it will be removed from its cell in the four meter, and it'll be craned down, um, it'll be cleaned and deilluminized, and then it'll be loaded into the chamber and re-illuminized. It's about a two to three week process. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. So I had a question real quick about those uh, fiber optic things inserted in that pedal. Are okay. they kind of like light bright things inserted? Yeah, in exactly. <laughs> yeah, they are. Okay. I mean, they're not like light bright things. They look like it, but they're really fiber optic. So, you know, these are just, um, you know, basically thousands of fiber optic cables, you know, and fiber optics basically just transport light. That's all fiber optic does. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a glass. It's physical glass. The light enters and it has perfect internal reflection. So the light just keeps reflecting inside of that fiber until it gets all the way down to where the spectrographs are. And then the light's delivered to the spectrographs. So not quite like a light bright, although, you know, I can see the uh, how it kind of looks like that. And in this case, we have 5,000 robots placing these fibers instead of like, say, your fingers. And they don't light up into different colors. They're lit up by the starlight from the other side. But yeah, it definitely does look like that. So my That's question so cool. was, are they like inserted in a similar manner to the light bright thing? Yeah, kind of. I mean, it's it's a little bit different than that, but yeah, not too dissimilar. You can kind of see where the holes are and how they're moved. Um, right. Yeah, they can, they kind of move. Cool. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then Bill had a question. Yeah, so how do, how does Spectra allow you to say anything about the distribution of dark energy? Yeah, so what happens is we use those spectral lines in the same way that we measure the Doppler effect um, for um, radial velocity studies of exosolar planets. We actually can also measure the shift in those lines, except in this case, the shift isn't caused by the physical motion of the object. It's actually caused by the expansion of space. <laughs> and all of the lines are moving away from us. There is no blue shift. It's all red shifted. So I kind of imagine this as like if you put two dots on a balloon and you blow up the balloon, you didn't physically move the dots on the balloon and yet they get further apart because what changed was the space between the dots because the balloon expanded. Space is kind of like the balloon. So as space expands, um, objects move further away and it makes uh, it appear as they move away from us, it makes the light look like the spectrum is shifted to the red. So by measuring the spectrum of basically 30 million ga galaxies, which is what we're doing with DESI over five years, um, we're able to build a map of how all these galaxies are moving. And that map actually tells us something about dark energy, because dark energy is one of the things that's precipitating how fast they're moving, and the fact that they're all moving away from us, and the fact that they're accelerating away from us. That is actually because of dark energy. So by studying not just the galaxies, but the motion of these galaxies, um, not only can we map dark energy, but then we also have a map of the three dimensional universe, because we're going to have a specter of 30 million galaxies. <laughs> I hope that makes some sense. Yes, it does. <laughs> How many clear nights do you get a year on average? 
That's a hard question right now. We've had a really tough winter. Oh, no. <laughs> so, you know, Florida, Florida is the land of uh, Florida. Arizona is the land of sun. Um, you know, we probably do get something like, you know, I don't know, probably 300, you know, sunny days in Arizona. I don't know how many that corresponds to in, in good nights because we have winter, we have, we have mountain weather. Right. And so we don't do as well as the rest of Arizona. We're on a mountain, which is beneficial to us because we have less atmosphere, obviously, but we also do have snowstorms and mountain weather. So so I can't tell you exactly. I can tell you that it's more than we had at LBT. LBT, unfortunately, it was built in the middle of a fine pine forest and it created its own weather. There were nights that I was there and the only cloud in the sky was the one directly above the telescope. And particular clouds would form directly above the telescope. So um, and where, where was the LB, what, what is LBT and where was it? LBT is the large binocular telescope oh. located um, in also in Arizona, but out on Mount Graham near the border Man. between Arizona Man. and New Mexico. It's a beautiful Man. telescope, but they have about 40% weather loss. I think here the weather loss is probably closer to 20 or 25%. Mm -hmm. And also for us, you know, a cloudy night isn't the worst thing, but very bad seeing can actually be worse for us. So, mm -hmm. um, so we have a combination of bad seeing, which again is turbulence in the atmosphere. You have clouds. Um, that can you know change the night, and then you also have the moon. For certain projects, the moon can be more detrimental than anything else. Mm -hmm. What about light pollution? In I actually air? see that Mary has her hand up, and I think has for a while. Do you mind if I call on Go her? Go right ahead, Mary. Hi. Um, hi. Um, I'm a librarian for the society, and I also run the book club. In May, uh, we're reading a biography about the first director of Kit Peak. Um, <laughs> Aiden Minel and uh, his wife Marjorie. It's titled "With Stars in Their Eyes: The Extraordinary Li Lives of and Enduring Genius of Aiden and Marjorie Minel" by Alec Pridgen and James B. Breckenridge. The okay. authors will be joining us. Um, oh, that's Zoom. amazing! And also Cynthia Osborne, who was the Minel's uh, secretary for many years. So the three of them will be joining us. I did want to extend an invitation to you and your team. If they'd like to zoom in and join us, it would be delightful. And I'm sure um, Alec and um, Jim would, would welcome um, having members of you and members of the team there. Um, I'd also like to ask um, if you have any thoughts about the book, if you've read it, and um, any thoughts that you may have about um, the Minels. Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't read it, so I will ha have to do that. Um, I have many thoughts about the the overall foundings of the observatory. For those that don't know, the observatory was founded in the 1950s. I do want to point out again that we are on um, indigenous land here. We are on the Tona Autumn Nation. Um, and so there's um, a lot of interesting history about how that was negotiated and how that's worked. Um, and we are, you know, working in collaboration with the nation now to make sure that the observatory stays beneficial to them um, and that, you know, we're doing beneficial science here. So I, I would love to join for that discussion if I'm available. That sounds like it would be great. I, I, I am a, a student of history. And so um, I often would say that, um, you know, astronomy is just a, a much longer history of the universe, but it is still a history lesson. So um, I, I am interested in that. I'll send you, we'll send you the Zoom link. Thank you. Yeah. I was asking um, about uh, light pollution mm -hmm. in the area. I was there yes. like I said, a number of years ago and it was actually before the fire, which is what I also wanted to ask you about. Yeah. <laughs> Real quickly, uh, was any of the telescopes themselves damaged at all? Yeah, so I kind of anticipated that there might be a fire question. For those that don't know, um, and I don't want to spend too much time, but I think it really is important to discuss um, and to highlight, and mostly because I just want to highlight the efforts of the amazing firefighters who actually saved this observatory this last summer. So I'll just share my screen again quickly. Okay. So in June of 2022, um, Kid Peak Observatory was basically overrun by a fast moving wildfire um, that ended up burning tens of thousands of acres um, in the Bobby Kivari and Quinlan Mountain range. So we actually, um, this started out as a small lightning fire um, about 10 miles from the observatory. 
Um, and by the time it was done, it had overrun the entire observatory. And basically we had, it, it, it actually did, um, and I can show just, this is actually what it looked like. The yellow line that you see painted on here was applied afterwards. That is actually the road to Kitt Peak. This is a view of the Southwest Ridge where we have multiple telescopes. The fire came up and over the Southwest Ridge. Um, this is actually an image. You can actually see telescopes. This um, here is the VLBA. And these are the MDM telescopes um, and the fire literally burned right up to their door and at some point in time we thought that we would lose them. Um, it then unfortunately turned uh, to the main observatory and we almost lost the entire observatory, the observatory was significantly impacted um, just to give you an idea. Um, we did lose uh, two dormitories, others were destroyed, but the bigger news was that um, it wiped out our electrical power grid, it wiped out all of our fiber optics. Um, when we returned to the observatory, we didn't have water, we didn't have power, we didn't have garbage removal, we had rodents, it was, it was really tough, day zero was really tough. And it was only through the efforts of a really amazing Kit Peak staff who just worked nonstop um, that we actually were able to recover in time to start science again in September. We had what we called sneaker net. We had no fiber optics, so we were taking rate arrays actually down to Tucson. That's how we were getting the data where it needed to go. Um, we were running off of generator power. We had seven generators at any one point in time at this mountain. And so really this year has been a year of great thanks at Kapik Observatory um, and also of recovery. And I you know, just wanna publicly thank um, the firefighters of the Southeast AZ type three and the Eastern type two incident management teams who basically hundreds and hundreds of firefighters that battled for basically 10 days um, to save this observatory. And you can kind of see from this picture, this black area, um, it just came right up and over over the Southwest Ridge and then came back towards the main observatory. I think it was, yeah, that kind of gives you an idea. Um, the red is where it, it burned up until the 18th. It burned up and over the observatory and came back down the mountains on the following days. So the only thing that was really protected was the top of the mountain here. Pretty intense. Has the observatory, the whole plan I'm talking about, where the observatory, all the observatories sit, have they increased their fire fighting capability by adding more fire hydrants, more water, somehow water towers, you know, things like that. So, you know, one thing I learned about wild firefighters is that they bring their own water. Uh, they don't need yours. We had uh, water hydrants here. Actually, we had an extensive wa water hydrant system. Um, the problem was that it was powered by power. Like the only way to pump the water was to have a water pump. And when the power died, so did the water pump. So it turns out that they fought this fire completely with water of their own sources. There's water throughout the area. We actually also have a reservoir here. Um, and not only did they fight it with water, but they brought in VLADs, which are DC-10s that are loaded with a fire retardant substance. So that actually is how they fought the fire mostly um, with mm -hmm. that retardant. They mm -hmm. also had bucket brigade, helicopter bucket brigades basically that went off to get water and came back. Wow. Yeah. Thank you very much for explaining that. Yep. Any other questions? I know you have a lot of business there and um, they're getting ready to observe here at Wynn. So I definitely need to sign off. I just wanted to thank you all again for extending me the invitation. This has been really an adventure. I had a lot of fun here doing this and it was nice to see you again, Rob. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. Okay, and I'll look forward to that invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody appreciated it. Wonderful. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so just a little bit of quick business. We'll try and keep this as short as possible. Uh, first of all, I don't see any new members, but I'd like to welcome anybody and you can introduce yourselves later uh, so that we can get on to the next thing, but thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'd like to discuss really quick, a number of us went up to Nice this past weekend. We had two different contingents. It was a very fantastic time and we can tell you more about it later. Mm -hmm. uh, next item is the May dinner meeting. Jeff, you want to say a thing or two about that? Yep. So all of the essential details of the May dinner are now finalized. Um, we now have a speaker, which I am beyond excited about. We will be joined by the Deputy Chief Scientist for the James Webb Telescope, um, which is not only pretty awesome, but pretty timely. Um, a number of years ago, we had Mike Menzel, who was the chief engineer, talk about the upcoming James Webb. And now we can hear a little about how the launch went, the deployment, what data they've gathered so far, and what the plans for it moving forward. Um, 
The website is up. Uh, there's a number of ways to find it. The easiest is just to go to the club's website, dellastro.org, and there's a big banner right across the front that announces the dinner meeting. If you click on that, it takes you to the webpage for the dinner meeting with all of the details, including the location, the menu, and the link to register. Um, to register, you can do PayPal, which is right off the website, or um, Bob Troublecock is here in person, so you could pay him in person here tonight, um, or you could mail him a check, and his address is on the website. Um, we are in Newark, Delaware now, not Wilmington, uh, St. Thomas Episcopal Church. Um, we've had a three-year hiatus. We're very excited to resurrect the dinner meeting. Very excited to have this speaker, and we would love to have an awesome turnout. Um, this is a meeting, again, that we encourage now, as many members as possible to come out to, but we also encourage spouses, friends, neighbors, coworkers, um, spread the word. Because um, again, we would love to have a great turnout um, to support the speaker. Oh, sorry, the deputy chief scientist, Jonathan Gardner. Um, again, you'll see his, his information on the website. Um, again, we'd really love to have a great turnout for that event. Um, full meal, great talk. Um, Water and soda provided with the meal, beer and wine available um, for donate added, you know, with donation. Um, all the details you need should be on the website and in the focus. Um, obviously, if you have any questions, ask me or any of the other DAS officers. And again, really hope to see everyone out there. Wonderful. All right. Next item is extremely important. It's required by the bylaws. So as you know, every couple of years. Uh, we have elections in alternating years for different groups on our board of directors. We have the officers and in the one year, and then we have the board members at large in the other years. So this is a year for the board members at large election. There are three board members at large, and they represent the interests of the club. Um, it doesn't have as many responsibilities as other positions on the board, uh, but it is doing a great service by getting the members' voices heard on the board. So we have uh, two board members at large who are choosing to run again. Uh, Dave Grosky right here has been on the board and been involved with Mark Cuban for a number of years. Thank you very much for running again, fantastic. Uh, Sydney is a newer uh, board member at large. He just got the position fairly recently, I think about six months ago, and he's done a great job so far. And uh, we appreciate it and uh, keep going. And Bill Hannigan uh, has been on our board for a number of years. He has unfortunately decided to step down, but thank you very much for your service over the years, Bill. We appreciate it. And uh, Bill's vacancy leaves open one position uh, for the board members at large. So I'm supposed to open up the floor at this point to anybody who would like to volunteer or be nominated. So if somebody else wants to nominate someone for the position, they can do that as well. And then the person, of course, would accept, hopefully and then run in the election. So I'm opening it up to the floor. If anybody else who didn't tell me yet is interested in running, now is your chance. And just an important note, the slate of candidates will be closed, I guess, at the now. end of this meeting. So yeah, this meeting is done. If this you'd like to run, now's the time. Last chance. Everybody's <laughs> <laughs> Yes? Gary? Why not? All right, Terry has decided to run. Thank you very much, Terry. Fantastic. It would be an honor. Awesome. Hey, we would be honored for you to join us. Fantastic. All right, so we now have three candidates for web members at large, and there are three positions. So I hope that all of you can. Mathematically speaking, I think you've got a great chance. <laughs> Most likely. Uh, but of course, we still have to run the election. So I will be setting that up. And you can expect that you receive your ballots um, on or shortly before May 1st. And then the election will run for one month till May 31st. And you can vote any time in that time, uh, but you can only vote once, of course. And then at the end of the election, I'll announce the winners Ooh. so everybody knows. And those terms start, I always forget. Uh, July 1st. Yeah, okay. Yeah, July 1st. And those terms then run for two more years until we have our next election. Okay.
And uh, let's see, the next thing we need to discuss is the Woodside Farm Creamery event. Can someone speak to that? Sure. Yeah. Actually, Rob, might, might be more effective. Um, do you want to open up the club's calendar? Because we've got a number of outreach events coming up. Yeah, and we could just kind of hit them as we go down the list. Now, let me do that. I think it's still open. I also want everyone to watch tomorrow. Yep, there it is. I'm so actually, before Woodside, wait a minute. I'm going to share it real quick. Yeah. So the people on Zoom can see. So actually, it looks like we have Bellevue. Wait, oh no, where is Woodside? Okay, so we have Bellevue first. So, yes. so do you want to? We're back at Bellevue again, like you <laughs> always used to be. I'll, I'll send out a reminder uh, a couple of days before that. Watch the weather forecast. Uh, our first time trying to do this was rained out. So this is our second hopeful opportunity. And maybe our first outreach event in several years. Several years, yes. So we are set up with Bellevue to do it even monthly. The, the next quarter dates will be established and announced in, the, in another week or so. Cool. Um, yep, related to that, we are resurrecting our Woodside Farm Creamery outreach events. Um, in well, up until the pandemic, what we would do is for the duration. So, Woodside Farm Creamery is an ice ice cream shop in the Pike Creek Hocassin area. Very pretty location um, and very very delicious ice cream. And we, for many 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 years, for the six to eight months that they're open, they don't get a lot of ice cream sales in February. So they're open like April through October. And we would typically go out once one day each month and basically bring telescopes to share with um, their customers. And that's always a lot of fun because you typically get people that show up only thinking they might get an ice cream and get a peek at the moon or one of the planets that are generally pretty blown away. Um, for both the Bellevue and the Woodside and all of our outreach events, um, it's awesome to have help um, and to have people come out, um, not only because especially at Woodside, there tends to be a lot of customers. And the more telescopes we have, the quicker we can get people through and to see it. But it's also a really fun time for the DAS members to hang out and chat. And um, usually Woodside actually gives us some tokens um, to, help, uh, to help get us some free or heavily discounted ice cream ourselves. Um, and again, on the groups.io, there'll be some announcements about that coming up. And Greg, you have an event tomorrow night, right? Oh, yeah, we should mention you tomorrow, night tomorrow. tomorrow night event. I don't you forget. Yeah, right. Yes, we are going to open the saw one tomorrow night because the weather looks good. So, uh, yep. everybody who uh, hope you can come out and just uh, enjoy some views uh, right here at Mount Cuba. Yeah. And then, Bill, you have the event? Yes. Uh, yes, part of the special interest group will be on Friday night at 7 p.m. at Rick Spencer's. Weather's better on Friday and Saturday. Saturday is a little rainy. So cool. Um, if it if the weather actually improves it a little more for Friday, you may be able to set up telescopes or uh, and and potentially do some observing after the meeting. Right now, it's a little marginal. Hard to say for sure. But regardless of the weather, we'll tour the observatory and demonstrate the uh, automated roll-off route. Uh, we'll have Chinese takeout for dinner. And uh, we'll be talking about pre-planning, deep sky image acquisition, and, and particularly including choosing the uh, camera angle, which we haven't talked about before. We'll have a look at everyone's astrophotos and then finish up with a Q&A session on equipment and techniques. Very nice. So it's Friday, 7 p.m. The announcement will go out over groups to Ohio. Very nice. And then, Mary, do you have anything with the book club going up? Yes, I'd like to invite everyone to the book club meeting next Thursday, the 27th at 6, 7 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, we will be discussing Melanta Tauta. It is a, a very short um, uh, piece by Edward, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, who was an astronomer, uh, amateur astronomer of, um, of increasing reputation. And we will be joined by Professor Hal Poe, who is quite the expert in the cosmos uh, and Poe, uh, and a member of the Poe family. University of Delaware Professor John Jeb will be discussing uh, time Poe spent at the in Newark, Delaware, and Glenn Moyer, 
uh, who is an aviator and the editor of Ballooning Magazine will be joining us because Melanta Talta takes place on uh, a balloon, a hot air balloon. And so he will be discussing uh, balloon, ballooning from a technical perspective. Uh, the story is set in the year 2848. So for those of you who like sci-fi, um, this would be a good opportunity to participate in a book club meeting. Uh, and the story was recommended by DAS member Jim Cower, our, one of our most senior founding members. And um, he will hopefully be joining us and leading the discussion. Cool. And I can send you a copy of the story if uh, you can't access it readily on the internet and or have it in your collection already. Uh, we also recommend you read another work by Poe called um, Eureka. It ties into it beautifully if you have additional time for the reading. And then in May, um, we will be reading about the Minels, the uh, first director and his wife of the Kip Peak. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. It's wonderful. All right, so there's one more set of events and that's our astronomy workshops, which again meet every Tuesday. We've had a lot of very successful ones recently. We've had about a dozen or more people showing up weekly and we've been using our telescopes, the recent eyepieces that you might've seen talked about or heard talked about recently. We used a couple of them already and we're having a good time with them. So please come out to the Solon or come out on a Tuesday night and we'll have a lot of fun. Hope everybody has a good month, have fun, and enjoy. Yeah. There are desserts in the other room. <laughs>